So hello, everyone, uh, and apologies for my delay getting out of the um, breakout room. <laughs> um, so I am, um, you can all hear me, is that right? I am unmuted. Yes. Great. So I just wanted um, to um, start uh, with a little uh, bit about what brought this session on. It really comes out of my own concerns about how we cultivate the next generation of farmers and growers and what they need in terms of support and engagement in taking on, which, uh, you know, something I feel is such an important career. I just think um, uh, being a sustainable farmer and grower in the world that we live in today is so important. Um, we um, uh, really, um, uh, you know, have to turn things around in terms of of um, uh, our farming systems. Um, and farming and growing is not for the faint of heart, as I'm sure many of you on this um, uh, call uh, will know. It's a challenging and demanding profession, and it takes, I think, someone with remarkable commitment to the land and to their animals. And it takes bravery and strength in the face of really tough hardship uh, that most people won't do. Most people, you know, uh, it's too much. Um, I think that we're at a critical nexus of change. Um, we really have to make that transition from the um, quite dominant industrialized farming systems that, um, you know, uh, kind of run the world, although they're not the, you know, where most of our food comes from, but they're incredibly powerful. And we have to move towards agroecological and regenerative systems, which feed us proper food and, um, uh, and also work to preserve biodiversity and the environment more widely. Um, and we can't do this without our future generations taking up this precious and critical work. So I think, you know, it, it really is, um, you know, uh, our, our next steps forward. Um, so with that, um, I'm uh, just going to briefly introduce our speakers today. Um, we have Emma Eberhardt, who works in woodland management and horticulture in Cornwall. She's studying for an MSc in agroforestry and food security. And she is part of the core coordination team at FLAME um, to help make land work more accessible for young people. FLAME is, um, and tell me if I'm um, incorrect about this, uh, Emma, but as I understand it, FLAME is um, uh, under the uh, LWA, it's the, the kind of organization for young people in the LWA. Um, and she organizes site visits, shares resources and provides advice. Um, and then we also have Hannah Norman with us. Hannah is the most, uh, has most recently worked for Tubby Cymru as their horticulture development officer, but she's also worked with the Soil Association and the Abergavenny Food Festival. She was trained in horticulture on the Soil Association's Future Grower Program, which ran, um, I think, somewhere between 2015 and 2018. Um, and she runs a small plant nursery in the Brecon Beacons and manages a community garden as well. And um, then our third speaker uh, today will be Kate Mills. She's the charity manager at the DPJ Foundation, which provides a much needed service supporting mental health for those working in agriculture as part of the Share the Load program, uh, which runs uh, a 24-7 helpline. Um, and Kate grew up on a hill farm in the valleys near Neath, where, she, where her family farmed uh, beef and sheep, and she now lives on a sheep farm in the Gower. Um, so with that, I'm uh, going to um, let everybody speak um, uh, for about 10 minutes and kind of introduce um, uh, themselves uh, to our audience. And uh, then we can kind of move on for the, from there. So Emma, I, I'm going to ask you to start off. And I know I think that you have some slides. Is that right? Yeah. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Great, so I'm going to try and share my screen and see, see if it works. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, so I wanted to, to start off by thanking you for giving me the opportunity for talking today. It's uh, great to speak on such a great conference um, and to have the opportunity to voice the, the opinion of the youth on this issue. Um, so I have actually um, uh, named my presentation Building the Next Generation of Land Workers rather than uh, Farmers and Growers because I believe we need to revitalise all aspects of 
rural skills, including foresters, for example, especially if you want to increase um, woodland cover uh, in the UK and have um, more localised woodland production um, and do things like agroforestry too. Um, so as Elisa said, I'm from Flame and I'll go on to talk about um, Flame a bit more later on. Um, so I just wanted to start off by talking about my experience and how I got into land work. Um, so I'm currently working in woodland management, specifically coppicing and uh, horticulture on an organic market garden. Um, but I grew up in a city with um, very little access to nature. Um, I lived in a flat with um, no garden and I had a, a school playground with um, yeah no trees, no grass, no anything. So my interaction with nature did take um, a while and I wasn't really aware um, about land work being a, a job that was available out there. Um, so I guess for me, it was the little things that kind of made me aware of it. So I had some family members that had um, allotments and uh, used to grow their own vegetables. Um, when I was small, I went to a primary school for um, a few months in England uh, because I grew up in, in France. And there I had, um, I had a little bit of land that I could steward over. I could plant seeds and look after the plants. And I think those little things really had a big impact on me. Um, and as a young person, I got increasingly concerned about the environmental crisis, uh, which meant I went on to apply for a BSc in environmental science in the UK. And it was really during my time at university that I got more and more interested in land work. I volunteered on a student-led volunteer um, organisation um, running the allotments on campus, and I volunteered in a local wooden management business. Um, but I still didn't really consider it as a possible career I could get into. Um, I started to get involved in climate justice campaigning and following organisations like the Land, Work land Workers Alliance, who were advocating for agroecology, uh, food sovereignty and peasants' rights. Um, I then went on to work in environmental education in Wales and I'd planned to go travelling with the money I'd saved, but um, COVID meant that I had to reevaluate my plans and I ended up applying for this MSc that I'm currently doing in agroforestry and food security. And my plan was to work part-time to get the practical skills um, to work in the sector. Uh, and that proved to be very difficult. I spent about six months applying for jobs and I was unsuccessful in all of them. Um, for one traineeship, I was told that I needed to uh, volunteer for a couple of seasons in order to get the experience needed for the role. Um, so I did start to consider having to get another job in order to save up money to work over the summer to get the skills needed. Um, in the end, I ended up getting lucky and I was able to find uh, work with the woodland management business I used to volunteer for. And I found work through the organic market garden, which is a 45 minute drive from where I am um, by posting on a Facebook group. But many other young people aren't so lucky and have often have to uh, volunteer for many years before being able to get a paid job. Um, so now I'm gonna go on to talk a bit more about the solutions um, by starting of talking about how we can support young people who want to work in the sector, and then looking about how we can attract the next generation into this career. Um, so far off training is definitely lacking in this area. Um, I've just taken here a screenshot of a, a couple of traineeships I think are very uh, succinct. And I think, um, yeah, if we get, get traineeships like this all over the country, um, it would be definitely very helpful. So these are look at things like um, how to plan a market garden, developing cropping, cropping plans, having business skills, and more practical skills like driving a tractor, for example. So these are things that are not currently covered in the work I'm doing, for example, because it's not a structured traineeship as such. Um, secondly, support I found has been really important for me. So joining unions and networks, so for me, FLAME and ECVC Youth, which is the European coordination for the Via Campesina, has been really helpful. Just having that emotional support and being able to talk to other people who are interested in this area of work, because it can definitely be very a very isolating experience. Um, startup costs and land access are a huge barrier to new, new entrants, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and a couple of organizations I know that are trying to do things to address this problem is the Ecological Land Cooperative, which are buying up pieces of land across the UK um, to make and getting planning permission to make it more affordable for new entrants to start up their own business. And then the Kindling Trust are doing um, sort of 
approaching land tenureship in a different way by having a community owned approach. Uh, so communities can buy shares and the, the land is owned by the community rather than an individual, which means it's a bit of a, a longer term uh, project. And of course, grants and funding would be really helpful. And then finally, paid jobs, um, need more paid jobs. The kickstart scheme has been really great, uh, but it's definitely not enough. Um, and it's um, not necessarily addressing those uh, that are marginalized. Um, I think also if the government was to invest in agroecology, um, it would bring about a lot more local green jobs just by its very nature. It's a lot more labor intensive. So FLAME is a union of 16 to 25 year olds. We're about 60 members so far. Um, we were founded in about February or March of this year. So quite new still. Uh, we're volunteer led and we have support from the LWA. Our three principles are food for all, youth involvement and promoting agroecology. And we try to do this by providing education and collaborating with other organizations and partners across the UK, campaigning about this issue too. Um, so I'm, my role within it is to try to provide uh, resources and training and advice for young people considering careers. And we're currently in the process, uh, process of organizing site visits uh, for next year. So what about volunteering? Um, so I think personally, volunteering has definitely got a place to play. I know that for me, it was the gateway into um, uh, bringing my awareness into, you know, considering land work as um, a job that could be paid for myself. Um, but I think the, the issue arises when it becomes a necessary step to become employed and skilled. Um, I think it's important that charities and uh, community projects continue having volunteer voting opportunities for the public. Um, it's going to be important for people to have access to nature um, and also it just brings communities together. But I think when it comes to um, uh, working for a um, commercial business or gaining the skills, I think um, that's that's something that we need to solve. So the ECBC youth are doing research on this at the moment. They're working with Coventry University to gather data on young farmers uh, in Europe that have worked in agriculture. Um, and they're looking for participants at the moment. Uh, they want to interview people who are under 40 and that have either currently or previously worked on a farm in Europe. And they'd ask questions um, about sort of why you decided to work in farm work, how you made a living while training to become a farmer and the working conditions. And I think this is, um, yeah, incredibly important research. There's not enough um, data out there about this, this problem. And we need the data if we are to better inform policies. Um, then finally, looking at um, how we can make land work an attractive career for young people. Um, I think having an educational curriculum would be uh, an important step to take. So teaching agroecology and sustainable wooden management to children, having field visits, so going out there, having a look, you know, how is charcoal made? How are woodland managed? Um, how does it all work? Um, having land workers and farmers come in to talk about their work, having projects on school grounds, maybe such as, you know, look, having a little bit of land you can look after. And I think it just gives... Um, it just gives an, an option for you know children just then then know it's one of their options that they can go into and they know that it's it's, it's something that's done out there and um and it's, i think that's an important first step to take um i think also there's an opportunity to um make links with other interests young people have such as climate change and environment and wildlife because obviously land work is really related to all these issues and of course, uh, it's really important for uh, mental and physical health too. So um, I think having uh, children involved with these um, activities would be incredibly important. And also, I just wanted to say that actually young people are really interested in working land work. There's definitely a surge in interest at the moment. Um, and we just need to be able to provide that support um, to make it available. Because I know that in my situation, for example, if I hadn't been able to find paid work, I probably wouldn't have persevered. Um, and yeah, it's great to just have uh, young people's voice included in this discussion um, if we want to make land work accessible for everyone. Right, so I just wanted to finish off now by uh, this short extract from the report uh, from the Committee on World Food Security on promoting youth and engagement and employment in agriculture. Um, employment rates for youth are three times higher than for adults in all regions, and a vast majority of unemployed youth are young women. 
Among people who do not have jobs, youth have a higher incidence of working poverty and vulnerable employment than adults. Youth also face serious barriers in accessing land, credit and other productive assets for establishing their own livelihoods and many young people lack the rights of representation in workers unions or producers organisations. So we need to be investing in the next generation if we are to future proof agriculture and provide and um, and future proof the living landscape of our countryside. We need to fill the shortage of labour and the disappearance of rural skills and we need to change the narrative of land work being unskilled or going back in time to a romanticised version of peasant life. So thank you for listening. I've just um, put here the email address for Flame if you wanted to get in touch and the contact uh, address for participating in the research project that I talked about. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to hear from um, any young people in the audience that are listening in today about their experience um, and their views on the issue and maybe from other people who might be working on projects to address this at the moment. That's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Emma. Um, just a quick question before we move on to Hannah. Do you have any sense of how um, many of um, uh, the young people in Flame come from farming backgrounds or whether they're coming um, from a different, you know, uh, they're, they're sort of coming into farming without that background? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit of a mix. I think mo there's kind of, I'd, I'd say it's split between some people who've grown up on farms and mm -hmm. their, their parents are part of the RWA um, and another half which have not, not come from the, uh, this background, but uh, quite a lot of people live in London. So they're kind of working in food movements, but not mm -hmm. necessarily from a farming background itself and they're not necessarily working in land work themselves. Mm, that's quite interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that there's that el urban element. I um, uh, that quite surprises me. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that there were, were a number that weren't necessarily coming out of farming families, but mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Hannah, hi everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you to Alicia and Jane for um, asking me to speak this afternoon. Um, I've got a few slides to share. Um, let me give that a go now. Bear with me one second. There isn't too many, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> okay, right. just minimize you so you can't all see there we go brilliant so can you see the the presentation fantastic okay so i'm hannah norman i'm the horticulture development officer for uh tubby cymru amongst many other things which i'll get into now um it is actually my last day working for tubby cymru today <laughs> so going out with a bang doing this presentation for you all um, so I'm going to talk a bit about Tevi and the opportunities that they have, but also my experience as well, which is quite varied, some very similar to Emma's. Um, so, yeah, my we'll start off with my background then. So I work in small scale sustainable horticulture, both um, commercial and community. I like to say commercial because um, a lot of us in the small scale we see as, as working in the community, which we do. But commercial, I like to refer to is if you're making money. On your enterprise then you're a commercial business whether you're a csa or any other community focused um, enterprise um if you're making money you're commercial because it's good to think that way so i work with both commercial growers um, and community growers too um i advise um and train new entrants um and new businesses entering the sector i work with local groups to connect initiatives to localize food systems in a more sustainable way um, I work on a number of projects, including Tevi, which I'll talk about in a second, and Resilient Green Spaces, which you may may not have heard of. It's quite new. Um, actually, Tevi is hosted by Lantra, and Lantra are working on Resilient Green Spaces. That's a project that I can go into a bit more later on, because um, there's some new entrant opportunities there. Um, but the lead partner on that is Social Farms and Gardens, um, and that's looking at how we can better use green spaces um, in and around Wales, and I manage the skills um, work stream for that. Um, I am a trained organic grower. Uh, I did the Future Growers trainee program uh, oh, six, five, five years ago now. Um, so the, the 
so that's the Soil Association Knee Venture Training Programme. It actually went for 12 years, um, and it's a, it was a fantastic um, training programme, which has trained over 120 new entrants um, in the sector, many of which are still working in the sector. We did um, a, a big survey of, of all the future growers um, a few years ago, because after I... Um, did my traineeship and I did some working on farms. I actually went on to manage that program for the last year before it finished. Um, so I can talk a bit more about that afterwards as well if anyone's got any questions. And as Alicia mentioned, I currently have a small scale edible plant nursery up here in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and I'm a grower for a community garden in South Wales um, on the outskirts of Swansea. So I do lots and lots of different things. I wasn't gonna to go too much about into how I got into, uh, into growing. But um, worth mentioning, not from a farming background, I grew up in Wrexham in North Wales. Um, my dad was a keen gardener, but I didn't want anything to do with gardening when I was younger. Um, I came to growing as a second career, like an awful lot of new entrants do. My background is actually event management in the music industry, which I did for many years, loved. But I was so into environmentalism um, and I had friends through I lived in Cardiff at the time and I had friends who were growers I used to buy all my food from them from the farmer's market for years and years and I just knew that that was something I wanted to get into so it was actually urban it's funny that you just mentioned Alicia urban um, farming and urban growing it was actually that element that brought me into it I um, was really obsessed with um, rooftop farms and um, and hydroponics and ways of growing food and not just with water but ways of growing food in cities and urban areas um, and after some volunteering experience I and uh, doing a lot of woofing in America going to lots of small-scale farms over there and um, some in urban areas and some super super rural in the middle of you know states in the middle of nowhere uh, I got a Winston Churchill fellowship looking at localizing food systems um, in urban areas so I went to the states for three months I went across five different um, states looking at um, not just urban growing, but um, like how you can link rural farmers and rural food production to urban areas. So um, I have a nice balance of, I still can remember bits of bobs about all hydroponics and that side of things, but also since then, a lot of the, all the growing that I've done has primarily been um, rural and more traditional style of growing. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Tubby Cymru and the, um, what that project does, if you're not aware of it already. So um, Toby Cymru, um, you may have heard of Lantra. Lantra are a um, training organisation that runs across the UK. Um, and Toby Cymru is a project funded by WashGov um, to stimulate growth in Wales's commercial horticulture sector. So only work in Wales and only on horticulture. And it's commercially focused. But again, that does include CSAs and anybody who's making money. So um, supports commercial growers and horticulture businesses, capitalise on new market opportunities. And it's all about um, strengthening businesses by providing training and business support uh, for what growers need across the country. And it includes edibles, non-edibles, so ornamentals, um, organic, non-organic, everything in between and around it. So any grower, as long as you're making money, you can get support, fully funded support from the project. So some of the training that we provide, there's business development, um, things like compliance training. So a lot of these are useful for new entrants. So like first aid, manual handling, health and safety, have access to like supervising um, and other things like that. And there's financial management, anything from if you're a, a box scheme and you want to have a session on how to set up you know, um, how to run the accounts or how to set up a, a finance system for managing a box scheme, you know, anything like that. And um, digital marketing, anything to do with marketing, whether it's setting up um, a website, logo design, social media, anything to do with that. Cybersecurity, accreditation. Um, these are just some examples, cover everything. So technical training, these are some of the things we've done webinars and uh, sessions on recently. So cultivation of crops and seeds, so health, uh, composting, no-tail, integrated pest management. Um, and if you go on the uh, Tommy Henry website, everything that we've done over the past 18 months in lockdown has been recorded because we've had to go from everything to be face-to-face like everyone else to doing it online. And it's all on what we call the Knowledge Hub and everything's been recorded so you can watch everything back there. So we um, contract industry experts to deliver training 
um, and these are some of the um, experts and industry workers that we use to deliver the training. Um, we also have, we've now got a few more than what's on the slide. We've got um, networks. So if you want to join one of these networks, you can. All of this is completely free and fully funded. So for example, the pumpkin and squash network, that's all squash growers or people growing squash, but also squash farms too. And there will be site visits. There'll be experts in that area. So you can all have like sessions with that person. There's WhatsApp groups, you can all message each other and send each other pictures of pumpkins and squash. See how things are going. If you've got a pest and disease problem, you can chat with other people who are growing too. And the same for all the other networks as well. Um, I've mentioned all of these, all the things that Toby Penny does. And to be eligible, you have to register with the project, but it doesn't cost anything. It takes about 10 minutes to fill in a form online. And um, and you're eligible for for free support from the from the project. So that's Tuffy Kemry. As I say, it's my last day working for them today. <laughs> I'm going back to the Soil Association to work from the Soil Association from next week. Um, but yes, the the website's there, tuffykemry.co.uk. I got some contact details at the end. Um, so back to today's discussion. So I thought what would be more useful is to maybe put some questions out there because I know the majority of this session is going to be questions and, and talking different people's opinions. So I thought I would put some, some questions out there to consider that I would like to, these are things that I work with, which I don't have the answers for and I don't have the solutions, but it'd be really good to kind of get everybody talking about it. So something that comes up all the time, are we struggling to recruit new entrants into the sector? I'm going to say no. Um, we have, I do one-to-one -one sessions with, uh, new um, businesses, new entrants, um, and people diversifying into horticulture. And I probably speak to at least one person a week from Wales who's setting up a new enterprise. Um, majority have no training or experience, but it's something they feel really passionate about, and that's something that they want to do. Um, but one of these barriers is, you know, who are we making the training and opportunities accessible to? This is something that, that Emma touched on. There are a lot of barriers. Um, and we'll come on to that in a second, a bit more of that in a second. Um, something that I feel really passionate about is the quality assurance of training. How do we regulate it? This is something that um, I mentioned the Resilient Green Spaces project is looking at. There's two research pieces being done, one by Miller Research and one by Cardiff University. And that is looking at all the horticulture training opportunities that used to exist going back 10 years to what's available now from colleges that used to run you know, formal training courses that don't exist anymore, horticulture colleges that don't exist anymore. You know, there used to be more qualifications that you could get in the traditional route of training that just aren't there anymore. But what we do have is a lot of informal training, traineeships on, on farms, trainee programmes run by the likes of the, the one we're doing for Resilient Green Spaces and there's land workers and all these different um, brilliant organisations that are running training programmes. There's... Um, farms that are taking it upon themselves to run training programs or take on trainees. But the question to put out there is, how do we regulate the quality of that training? Um, you know, is it being, are what we're teaching people what they need to know? Is it a way of, are we calling something training? This comes down to the pay thing, which Emma brought up, which we'll discuss in a second. Are we, you know, are we using people for labor, but calling it a trainee program? Are we, what's the aim of all these trainings that are happening on farms? Are we expecting people to leave with a certain amount of knowledge or, you know, there's nobody regulating that. Is there something that we can be doing to make sure that our new entrants are learning, um, you know, get, making the most of these opportunities? The pay debate, um, where do we draw the line between volunteering and employment? Should and um, when should we be paying trainees and new entrants? This is something I feel extremely passionate about is paying people for their work. Um, like Emma, I got into the sector through doing an awful lot of volunteering because I wasn't in a position um, to be able to take, to be able to just not work. I had to work. So I had to get all my experience as far as I could do volunteer opportunities outside of full-time work. Um, and then the gaps to go woofing when I saved a bit of money. Um, and then when it came to doing my traineeship, I had to move out of Wales because there wasn't an opportunity available for me in Wales. And I had to move to Coventry for nine months to do my traineeship on um, uh, a farm, five acre farm, which is on the Coventry site, um, on the Garden of Galaxy in Coventry. It's a fantastic opportunity, but I was very lucky that I was able to do that. And not everybody has 
the opportunity to up sticks and move somewhere. I also had to find somewhere that was paid because I was in my mid to late 20s with commitments. I couldn't take unpaid work. So that cut out an awful lot of the, the traineeships that were available at the time. Um, so, yeah, that's something that a lot of people feel very passionate about on one side of the fence or the other, whether we should pay people or not or when we should pay people or not. So that would be good to discuss. Um, a bit later on in a bit more detail. Um, again, this is something which I advocate for. Is small-scale horticulture a viable long-term career option? So we talk about needing to get more people into the sector um, and we need more people growing and more people running, the, running uh, you know, sustainable businesses. But is it sustainable in terms of a long-term career? A lot of this comes back to pay. So, you know, when you're raising children, when you're you know, even renting, never mind trying to own the house or purchase a car, you know, these are big expenses. A lot of the, the work that's out there, we know is very poorly paid and we kind of go into that sector knowing it's not very well paid. But is there a point that like, when we did the survey with the future growers a couple of years ago, the, the, re the people who weren't working in horticulture anymore, were the reasons weren't the long hours, they, it wasn't like the hard work, the physical labor, but it was like they couldn't physically afford to do the work anymore because they did want a family or they did want other things. And it's like, you know, we choose this route because we care so much about the environment and about people's health and the food that we're producing. But does that mean we have to sacrifice, you know, the quality of life that we have? And if we are trying to encourage more people to come into the sector, can we sell to them that this is a long-term career choice that they won't have to drop out at some point because you know it's hard to make a living from or what have you. Um, and then the final thing is what opportunities are there for better access to land? Access to land is a big barrier um, to new entrants. Um, and there's a lot of this comes up all the time about how do you make it easier. And um, so I'd like to throw that into the, the discussion as well. And one other thing is we presume that new entrants want to start a business. Um, and it's not discussed very often that some people just want to be a grower. So, you know, some people don't want to manage finances. They don't want to run a business. They don't want to do the marketing. They don't want to do all the things that come with running an actual business. Some new entrants and some people working in the sector already just want to be a grower. And how do we create more jobs just for growers in the sector um, rather than treating all new entrants like everybody's going to be looking for land? and everybody's gonna to wanna to start a business. Yes, there are many people that want to do that, but do we have enough farms and, and, and enterprises in the sector that are growing enough to be able to just employ somebody as, as a grower? So they're the questions I'm gonna put out there. I've probably gone over my 10 minutes lot. Um, I think that's it. These have kind of already been um, covered by Emma. Um, these are some of the new entrant training opportunities that are out there. The only one I'll quickly mention is this Resilient Green Spaces opportunity because that's going to be advertised in the next couple of weeks. So um, it's a two-year, the skills um, part of the, of the programme, it's a two-year pilot training programme in Wales um, for new entrants. Um, we ran the first year as a pilot of a pilot this year. So it's Lantra um, in collaboration with Land Workers Alliance um, and Cardiff University. We're about to go into the second year now, um, and there's some opportunities for if you are a horticulture enterprise or a farm and you are going to employ a new entrant, a trainee this year. We're looking for five to ten farms who are taking on trainees, and this program supplements their learning. So they obviously have the day to day learning with you on the farm, and then this um, program is weekend visits and study visits, it's webinars to supplement the learning in more depth. Um, than what maybe what you're able to de deliver on a day to day, particularly in the summer when you're really busy. So um, if you go on the Social Farms and Gardens website, there's a bit on Land Workers and Lunch website as well. There's more information. We're also looking for new entrants and we're also looking for trainers who want to be part of delivering the training as well. So that's just a little bit out about that. And if you want more information on that, you can contact Tubby Henry at lunch.co.uk. And that's my contact um, email address there, hello at backyardorganics.co.uk. So 
Sorry, I went on a little bit there, Alicia. <laughs> That's all okay. right. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I was going to say, yeah, there's uh, definitely a question there. I was thinking, um, uh, you know, when you were talking about um, people's ability to, you know, have uh, uh, a kind of personal life and a work life that uh, uh, they can balance between the two. I do also think that very much um, has uh, something to do with the economics of small scale farming. And we, you know, are at the moment, I think, rather trapped in a system in which it is still um, more um, 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 cost effective for farmers uh, to, um, uh, you know, uh, it, we need to flip that system so that, you know, that um, uh, the people who are, are working agroecologically and sustainably, um, that that actually um, uh, has more value put to it, you know, economically, financially than um, uh, than uh, farmers and and uh, growers are people who are involved in something that's um, um, uh, you know uh, problematic in terms of our industrial um, uh, farming systems, um, uh, and I think that makes a you know that makes a big difference. And I think it is you know particularly when you get down on the small scale a very tricky issue. You know how you how you balance that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we'll we can come back around to this. Kate, do you want to um, have your say? Thanks. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking um, thank you for the invitation to join you today. I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective in that I'm going to be talking about supporting mental health, although I know that we've had a number of um, things mentioned already today that put mental health in the centre of what we do. So in terms of just, just to start a little bit about the DPJ Foundation and who we are, we're an agricultural mental health charity that works in Wales. We work with anybody in agriculture that would be growers, livestock farmers, large and small scale. Um, and we provide support, education and essentially try to have conversations around mental health to challenge the stigma that still very much exists and that stops people from accessing support. We were established in 2016. So we've been going for about five and a half years now. And we, um, we were created through some really tragic circumstances. Daniel Pickton Jones, whose name we carry, he took his own life. He was an agricultural contractor, a young man with a young family. Um, he hadn't been able to access services that worked for him in the way that he needed to. Like many people in agriculture and horticulture, the hours are irregular. You're not necessarily working nine to five when services might be available to you. And also you might be speaking to somebody who doesn't understand your lifestyle, your way of life, your working life. So that's where the DPJ Foundation came from. And um, you can see on the bottom there, our sticker, Talking Helps My Shadows and Help Me. And we provide a 24 hour telephone helpline. And that's really, um, for some people, that's a lifeline as well as providing access to counselling. So we cover the whole of Wales and we operate bilingually. And that's really important as well. Certainly in certain parts of Wales, Welsh is the first language that people live their lives in. And we try to provide our service in that language. We're a um, small organisation. We've got three members of, um, uh, uh, three employees and one sessional administrator who works with us. But we work with 50 self-employed counsellors and they're professional counsellors who have um, their own skills and training. It was quite interesting hearing the discussion around, um, around pay for work because we are in the process of looking at working with some trainee counsellors and part of the counselling training is to volunteer to acquire training hours. So it's, it's a little like it sounds like the entrance to, um, to, to getting on the growing ladder as well. Um, we are very much reliant on our volunteers. Our helpline is staffed by volunteers and um, our stigma be beating work is delivered by volunteers. Without our volunteers, we simply wouldn't be able to exist. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about, it's a little bit about what is mental health and how it might affect you, impact you. And the key, the key thing really is that we all have mental health. 
we all encounter challenges throughout our life that will impact on how our mental health is at that particular time. And we can all take actions that can help our mental health be better. But there's also sometimes where we won't be able to do anything for ourselves and we need that extra help. So it's really important to appreciate that mental health will fluctuate. It can be linked to our physical health. Um, and it really, it impacts on how we can manage life and the, the stresses that life will throw at us that we'll encounter day to day. And if our mental health is, is good and strong, we will be able, able to overcome those stresses. But if we're feeling um, in a more difficult place, then even the smaller stress can provide that extra thing that pushes us over the edge, essentially. And there's so many things that can contribute to changes in our mental health. And finances I have on the top of our list there. And we've, again, heard about trying to, to do something you love, but simply not having the money to be able to do that. And that can really be something that, that does impact on how you're feeling and, and can be you know, that extra pressure. Through our helpline, our helpline is confidential, but we, um, we, we capture themes that come through. And we often do get calls from people, young farmers or young want-to-be farmers, who are in that, at that point where they've spent time working for free on a family farm, potentially. And they've got to make a decision as to whether they continue in that business, whether they stay where they are or whether they try to get, get work elsewhere. And it, it is that, that, you know, that decision about whether to, to stay doing what they're doing or to do something else is very real for many farmers across Wales. Relationship issues, physical health, these are all things that are really very real for, um, for farmers. And it, that, you know, that, that physical health and the impact that has on your ability to do your job. And if you can't do your job, then that obviously, um, can undermine who you are, how you feel. Um, workload, working in all weathers, these are all things that, that will be very familiar to us. And yet they're the sorts of things that can make, make us feel particularly bad. And I know for myself that this time of year is especially difficult. It's dark, it's wet, it's cold. And I, I know the things that I can do to make myself feel better and to, to try to overcome those sad type symptoms. But that's not the case for everybody. And, and having, um, you know, having a recognition of what can contribute to poor mental health is important because you can then look at how you can support it. And there's signs of poor mental health are vital for knowing what to look for in yourself or for other people. We also get told by people that we've supported that until somebody suggested they get support, they didn't realise they needed help. It can be very easy to slip into a downward spiral where you're not really you're, you're taking for granted that you don't feel very good and that becomes the norm and that normalizing of feeling feeling down isn't helpful and it can be really difficult to reach out for help at that point so that's why it's really vital as as a community that we reach out to each other as well but um People who isolate themselves, people who experience changes, changes in their appearance, change in their attitude, um, lack of self-care, a negative outlook. These are all the sorts of things that can be an indicator that somebody is struggling with their mental health. But they can also be an indicator that you're personally struggling with your mental health. And, um, you know, ha having to think about those things can really be a difference to whether or not somebody can get help or not. Um, Ways to promote well-being. I've included the five ways to well-being that are included by the NHS and have been recognised internationally as being ways to feel better. And they seem like common sense, but actually we don't always, always follow these. Staying connected. We've heard earlier on today about networks and the importance of having a network. Tavi obviously have a range of networks that you can be part of to learn from each other and support one another. But equally, um, when Emma was talking about Flame and the Flame Network, that's a, that's a way to support, to have peer support. Because actually, if you're going through a difficult time, having somebody who understands you and maybe can empathise easier because they've been through that same experience can be really quite uplifting and can be the support that you need. Staying active and 
we might have physical jobs, but actually doing something different, something that's that's away from that, that's active, whether that is just going for a walk or doing something like I, I play netball. And that for me is something that really helps me to switch off, to, to change my mindset, taking notice and enjoying the simple things. And that can be just feeling the soil in your fingers. I, I know that that certainly last year I found that my garden was my lifeline, being able to just nurture things and feel them grow. But actually getting my nails dirty was was the real key thing that that helped me to to feel connected and to, to take that time out. But that would be very different for different people listening to birdsong, working outside. We actually get those benefits because we are in in. You know, we're in the environment, we can hear what's going on. But actually, sometimes we can be so busy trying to do the work that we don't stop and listen. Taking a break is essential. It's it can be so empowering just to take that time out and see what what else is going on in life, whether that's five minutes, 10 minutes or a week. Just having that time away is refreshing, recharging and being able to move forward with fresh um, pizzazz, I suppose learning something new and giving back to friends and community and obviously eating well, but developing yourself, keeping on that constant learning um, uh, cycle of being able to develop yourself, learn something new is it, it's, it's so helpful and so important. I talked about networks and support, and I wanted to show this slide just to demonstrate how much support there is out there already. There's support for mental health, um, and I put on their silver cloud. I just wanted to mention that because that's an NHS resource that anybody can self-refer into in Wales. Um, it's a CBT type therapy and it, it you know, it is available there. Um, you can access it online. There's a variety of support for farmers and um, the Farm Well Wales resource include business and personal support, which lists some of the others. I've, I've included Flame there as a um, as a network and a group, but also C which is available for young people up to 28. So being part of something and knowing you're not on your own is so important. Very quickly, as I'm really conscious of time, just in terms of what we do, this is our helpline, share the load. And it's available to anybody in agriculture, which would include growers within Wales. And it's you don't have to be a technical farmer, but you must be within that, that farming workforce. So it's a 24 hour helpline is completely confidential. We only ask for your first name when you're making contact. You can text into the line if you prefer and you can speak to somebody on the end of the phone, but you can also get access to fully funded counselling within a week. And it's what we're finding is that that is the important bit for many people, having that professional service to actually help them understand how they're feeling and move forward. We also deliver mental health awareness training which can help you to understand more about mental health, but also learn some tips and techniques for helping yourself and helping somebody else, as well as being able to uh, do some first aid, I suppose, around mental health. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, and daily we put out posts to raise awareness of um, that you're not on your own. We hopefully are flooding people's timelines with um, with messages of support that encourage them to have that positive outlook and to know that they aren't on their own, that there's somebody there no matter what. And then that's me. There's my contact details if anybody would like to get in touch. Um, and once again, thank you very much for the invitation and for listening. Thank you so much, Kate. That was great. I do think um, uh, that aspect of community and building communities um, is so important, I think, particularly for young people. I mean, that's one of the things I think, um, uh, Emma, as you were talking about flame, just making those connections and, um, uh, you know, um, having peers within your group that share those those interests. And, and that's so important because farming, I think we all know farming and growing can both be quite isolating sometimes. Sometimes you're out on your own and 
Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's very, um, uh, uh, can be very tough also if, if you're, you know, dealing with a whole array of issues can be very um, uh, stressful. Um, so I, I was going to open the um, this up to the chat. One of the things um, uh, I sort of noticed at the very beginning of the chat was the discussion about the dis the uh, disappearance of um, kind of fur uh, further education and and um, HE um, organizations in terms of of training and the way that training has become less formalized. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I know that has always struck me is that. Um, particularly, I think with HE, um, training that has to do with sustainability, with sustainable farming methods and organic farming methods, um, often is an add on to um, kind of, you know, um, uh, more traditional programs. And um, I just was I wanted to get some feedback from people on on uh, whether there was any sense that that could could be flipped in a way because we really do need to w move into more sustainable farming methods um uh and um uh and and what seems to have happened out of that is again this kind of um uh, uh deformalization where people are looking to get training in sustainable um regenerative um, agroecological practices uh but it's not happening within those institutions and if anyone wants to jump in on that. I can uh, jump in there uh, just to start off, I guess. Um, yeah, there's definitely been a decline in um, the more formal training that's available in horticulture um, and food production, food production. And as you say, even with the RHS courses, like, you know, the um, on the level two, which I've done recently, just to, you know, brush up on certain skills and knowledge is that sustainable projects is a very small module on a quite a lengthy program um but maybe this you know there's an opportunity here where a lot of these courses are all fully subscribed all the time like for example black mountain college i think someone mentioned in the comments we were looking at this recently in Tubby, is that you know there's an agroecological training program there which i'm not sure is accredited yet but I think that's the direction it's going in and it was fully subscribed straight away so there's a lot of people who are interested in doing these things so i think there's a huge opportunity for more formal training um to go down the sustainable route and it will be about sustainable production and agroecological production but there is now the demand for it we just need people to create those courses for people and there's the you know there's the debate between do you need formal training but i think what we need formal training for is for younger people now what we found with the soil association future growers program uh, scheme was that i would say 95 percent of the people who did that program were in their mid-20s onwards coming at it as a second career but if we want people to go into it from a younger age i think we have to have options that you know if people were going into the trades or they were doing those kind of qualifications that there is an option for them to have some sort of formal qualification because I think it's drilled into us from a young age that we need a formal qualification when choosing a career. So if we have those available, then hopefully we can target younger people to go into this as a career. So there's the start. <laughs> yeah, it does seem to me that the more uh, sort of like sustainable farming uh, training is more it's more organized by sort of individual farms and uh networks it's not there's not for, so far as i know no accredited training in sustainable farming or the sort of um the ones that are associated with universities are more conventional farming um so that's yeah i think and i think that yeah it goes back to the point that hannah was making i, th I think having accredited training will draw in more young people um and I think I think there does need to be a certain amount of um, quality assurance too to make sure everybody's you know learning the same thing and it's sort of we're learning what we we need to be learning. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's interesting that um, that it's, it seems to be like the, that the kind of more sustainable things are more like local scale um, and seem to be a bit more dispersed. There seems, seems to be a lot going on, but it's not connected and not coordinated. 
Yeah, I do wonder about um, how that shifts in terms of what accreditation uh, it, there is out there in terms of the practices and and um, uh, that becoming uh, more mainstream. I'm just I, I was very aware also uh, years ago when when we started, uh, my husband and I started farming and he came into it from a, a different career and thought, oh, well, I'll go to university as an, uh, an older student and realized quite quickly after talking to different universities that he would come out an agronomist, but not a farmer. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I do think that's probably problematic you know we need we need support with people who want to be farmers <laughs> and growers yeah definitely and even on more you know some of the well-known agricultural universities there aren't really many options to look to learn about sustainable production um you know sustainable farming across the sector even on large scale there aren't really many opportunities for you know again i think it's like an add-on module module for people um, but you know we encourage you know there's this big push for more school I know people mentioned in the comments about school farms and school gardens and you know kids learning to grow at home and you know that's really really important in that journey of like kids learning where their food comes from and then there just seems to be this gap of well where do they go if they actually want to make that career and if they can't see that there's actually some formal training or some route for it to be a career then they're not going to consider it as a career so there has to be you know some some options there for people but then there's also a lot of, a lot of value in the non-formal training I think for older people not older people but people coming to it as well you know that I that's how I learned and you know but you do have to put yourself out there it is harder you have to have a certain privilege to be able to do that um, and that's where there's this barrier for older people learning. You know, if you're a mother with a few kids and, or, you know, responsibilities and you're like, I love growing and I want to get into this as a career, is there an option to do that? You can't just volunteer or take a low pay, really low paid job. So we're already cutting out, you know, a, a, a big wealth of the people who may actually want to do this as a career. And it's like, how do we make these opportunities more accessible for everybody as well, whether it's formal or, or informal training, there has to be some way of, of, you know, opening the doors to everybody for this to be a, a career for them. Um, I wonder if we might turn towards um, uh, the kind of monolithic issue of um, land access, um, if either of you want to, um, uh, you know, comment on and people in the um, also in the um, uh, wider audience about um, how we negotiate that. I mean, I know there there um, are uh, opening up a, a wider um, uh, array of issues in terms of how we might um, start to give more land access. Uh, but I just, yeah, was, would like to hear very, some thoughts on that. I, I, I um, So in terms of land access, that's something which, again, we, we see through our helpline, we see through speaking to people in training, that there's so many people who want to farm, but they simply haven't got that opportunity to um, to be able to get on the farming ladder, on the growing ladder, because they haven't got that capital to purchase land. And that, you know, that's just the, the way land prices are in Wales at the moment. That's completely spiraling out of most people's budgets, unless you're already farming in a large scale or you're um, a potentially somebody like Heathrow Airport, who've got the funds to buy up a land bit of carbon credit, essentially. It's, it needs to be a really joined up conversation all the way through the land access chain. We've, we, we seem to be disjointed. We've got regulations that have been introduced, which are then causing some people to buy more land so that they can work their books around that. We're, we're getting large organisations buying land to be able to plant trees remotely for themselves so that they're offsetting their carbon and then we've got people who really want to be able to add value to their local community to their local economy to themselves as well 
and to their own identity, but simply can't do it because they can't get on the land. Then we have schemes in place. We I know there's a scheme with um, with uh, Farming Connect, which involves matching people, the venture scheme between people who have land and want to retire. Because again, we have people in that category who actually want to see their their land continue in a in a, um, a productive way. They don't want to see it turned over to um, concrete or anything like that, but they haven't got a way forward from, you know, from the way that they see it. And then we've got young entrants who want to get onto the land, but the gap isn't being bridged yet. As far as I'm aware, that scheme hasn't taken off. So there's something there, there's a barrier towards that working. And you know, we've got examples of allotments are over, oversubscribed. You know, there's massive waiting lists for allotments for people to grow in in urban areas. But we need ways that we can enable people, whether that's through the tax system, so people aren't being penalised if they're if they're selling their land for a, a community venture, or to enable somebody young to be able to get onto it or to rent it. Um, and and also the subsidy system needs to work in favour of enabling people to be able to farm and grow when when they want to and produce high quality food in a sustainable way. I also wonder whether there's um, uh, a, a, a discussion around planning and how planning is used um, in relation to at land access. I mean, I do think the um, um uh i'm just just gone out of my uh the very forward looking planning policy that um uh came out of wales not too long ago anybody know the remember the name it's gone that a future not one future planet. generation what was that one, one planet. planet yes is a uh um uh you know i think really forward looking and of course that's more expansive than just in terms of um um uh farming or growing but um there just seems to be a disconnect um often um in planning in terms of what's happening with um parts of you know government i think that are engaged with farming and uh with food production and what's happening in planning and they're often um uh running in two different directions it feels like sometimes and that's and that that's actually um uh impacting um uh land access I don't know whether, yeah, anyone has any comments on that. And... Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, and I did, um, I don't know if Tom O'Kane is on the session. Um, we did a um, webinar last week on access to land at Toby Cymru for the Diversifying into Horticulture Programme. Um, and just sharing our ideas on, or our journeys on how we've accessed land. Mine has been long well it's taken like four over four years partly me moving around a little bit and that isn't four years looking in one place but um it is extremely difficult looking for small areas of land which is really what most new entrants or people looking to set up you know a small scale agroecological farm is after you know mainly under five acres a lot of the time especially to start with and it may grow grow from that um but uh yeah, for me, I've had a few offers over the years, but as we know as growers, not all land is equal. And it's about being sensible. If there's any entrance on here looking for land at the moment, it's about knowing what you're after and not just going for any bit of land that's available, you know, whether it's the right type of soil, the location for your roots to market, um, location to where you live, because chances are you're not going to be living on the land, which is a problem. That's a problem I've got. I finally got some land I got half an acre down the road from me here in the Brecon Beacons um to set up my plant nursery um so I grow uh organic blood plants for small scale growers in the area and also gardeners as well um and after my first year it has gone so well I need to upscale um but unfortunately I can't get planning on my site because I'm in the national park and I am now having to take 12 months off while I <laughs> Try and find somewhere else to move that because it's not economically viable at the size it is to be able to keep going well it is but it takes so much time on that scale so to make it because i can't i have to work around that until it grows to a size where i can just do that full time so um 
I haven't, I'm back to looking for land. So um, it's, you know, it is difficult. There are all these barriers, you know, the Brecon Beacons National Park Authority are really keen on more food production in the area. It's one of their, their goals for this year, but we have a lot of small growers who are struggling in the area to look for lands. And, and it just seems to be like, well, this is what you want. Here we are. And there seems to be this block in the middle. I know that happens all across the country. And um, I can understand, you know, we talk about more traditional farmers having loads of land or landowners. So the land that I lease has, um, it's not a farmer, he's a landowner who lives close by. Um, but, you know, I can understand from their perspective as well, and from speaking to quite a lot of farmers and landowners, that, you know, they can't really picture what we do. Their world on the lot is very different from the small scale agroecological agri growing world. And it's part of our job to sell to them what we do what it can look like they don't know what a market garden really looks like if they're a, you know a sheep farmer with like 50 100 150 acres um and also the subsidy system hasn't really worked in our favor in terms of if they give landowner their fear is that they won't get those subsidies and as kate has talked about the fear of losing these small amounts of money that actually help their their businesses and their livelihoods like why would they want to give anything away which puts them in a worse position because their priority is not these people are growing organic food for the local community their priority is i need to feed my own family and keep my own business going so hopefully with these shifts in you know public lands public good whatever that's going to look like that there may be an option that some more traditional farmers and landowners may want to now let more sustainable growers and sustainable operations onto their land and they will have a, they will benefit from it as well as, as having better access to land. Whether that will happen, I don't know, but fingers crossed. Yeah, I think the the future of land access is gonna have to be sort of community owned and having a shared owners, because I think not only would it break um bring down the cost but also bring down the workload um, and also if we want to move towards more agroecological uh farming methods then we need to be looking at mixed farming methods and having those integrated systems working with each other having you know um livestock resources being used in horticulture um and having you know uh, tree nurseries and plant nurseries alongside horticulture and having I think, you know, if we are going to be looking at having um, more sustainable farming methods, that is the key. And that means having multiple um, landowners working together. And if we can do that um, on the same land, then that would make it, um, yeah, more accessible, I, I would have thought. I think I totally agree with you that aspect of um, cooperative working, which there was a, a session yesterday on cooperative working on farms in a kind of broader sense. But, um, you know, it, it, in terms of an, and also um, in particular for our interest at expanding um, horticulture um, in Wales, it really does entail a network of smaller farms working together, I think, to make uh, uh, the kind of significant an imp impact that I think there is the ambition to make in Wales, you know, if we really want to be a country which um, uh, is grounded in producing its own horticulture, its own vegetables, um, uh, you know, it, it needs to um, um, uh, be able to encompass, I think, a, a wide array of different kinds of growers, probably mostly small. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And it comes back to that support as well, that peer support, mm. especially for new entrants who, you know, even if you've had five years of training on different farms, as I say, starting a business is a whole other ball game. And if you have people close by that, you know, you can work together, whether it's ordering, you know, your compost together to get it cheaper and less delivery, or, you know, when you're working long hours that there's people around that you can talk to, um co-ops and cooperative working is you know is definitely the future in terms of i don't know how that how that works with accessing land um you know it's it's still the same issue but i definitely think that's an option and also people going into other careers say i've got a plant nursery because i saw an opportunity where you know we have two main organic plant uh, plug producers and a lot of farmers grow their plugs in because they either don't have the space for propagation or whatnot so when um, and uh, i'm tiny like really tiny <laughs> but um you know there's more opportunities as well as just veg growers and market gardens and 
you know, what we need more compost, we need more seeds, we need all these other areas. We are not, it's not just veg production, you know, there are all these other careers within within the sector that we could be training people in or encouraging people to go into, but then link all these, these growers together and link all these farms. And that's cooperative working in the sense that, you know, we can shorten those supply chains and and, and make businesses more secure because we're not importing plants from abroad or wait for deliveries from Cambridgeshire even, you know, that we've got, you know, I know the local Greenways compost people here in Abergavenny ran out this year, and um, which was a massive problem for growers of all sizes. And, you know, um, so I think encouraging more cooperative working, but also thinking outside the box for people who are coming into the sector. Is there an area which they love? Like I love propagating, but, you know, it's an area that they love that they could set a business in business up in that supports all the other businesses as well. Mm. And I think within that also, it, it goes back, it made me think about um, Kate and what you had said about, you know, um, uh, building, it does then build a community as well and uh, a network of people who work together, which I think then does really what, you know, what your project does share the load. Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly having that collectivity is, is really, is really important. But actually delivering that can be quite challenging. And how do we do that? I, is, is how do we practically make this happen? Where I where I live in Gower, um, 10, maybe 15 years ago, there was a really successful cooperative that was um, Gower Growers, which would grow in um, grow in a variety of vegetables. And, and that, that went best. It simply wasn't able to be sustained. Where our food systems are creaking. Our food is really cheap. And, and yet we still have people who are going hungry. There's, there's, you know, there's a wider systemic issue here that's, that's causing problems. We expect our food to be um, for nothing. And yet so many homes are relying on food banks. So there's, there's a gap there. You know, there's some things not working. But, but going back to that point about working together and that, you know, that's something we see to a certain extent within the farming community already sharing um, sharing neighbour um, sharing informally sh sharing machinery informally that that type of arrangement but actually taking it to the next level then where we go to that ownership or shared ownership potentially that that needs some creative thinking and it's not something that would happen overnight it's not something that necessarily would be desirable to but it does need some brave thinking and some there are people already out there with it with land who are open to those sorts of conversations, but it's how we find them, how we protect them, how we protect the people who come on board in that kind of arrangement and invest their labour and their money. Um, and how do we make it viable? Because currently farm incomes are, if, if you take subsidy away for some, is, is negligible, if that, if at all. Um, for, I think the average, average um, was it about £12,000 a year? which is barely above the, the living wage. It's, you know, really, how do we make it an attractive career? Because we, we need farmers, we need growers, we need to eat. Um, and yet, it's probably one of the most important things we do. And yet in schools, it's not necessarily being prioritised. And, you know, from right down the very start, and I know as farmers, we've got a role to play in that. We've got a role to tell that story, to, to talk about passionately why it's such a great job, why it's such a, a, an important thing to be doing. But there is so much more that we could all be doing, and that includes at a government level. There's a, a great comment um, in the um, um, chat, which is about um, the need for, um, uh, you know, um, schools, you know, education around um, farming and growing. And, you know, I think that also extends to eating, you know, that that whole spectrum needs to be connected and it needs to start in, you know, at the youngest age and work right on up, um, because I think that's one of the, the most fundamental ways that will start to really, um, you know, both again, give more opportunities to young people to come into farming and see it as a viable career and want to, you know, see the importance of what um, uh, they do. But, um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's part of the, edu or should be part of the education system. I think it is in some cases, in some cases, it's not, it's a bit hit and miss at the moment. And I can see Jane waving at me. <laughs> So, no, 
Um, but um, I do think okay. we're, our time is up. <laughs> Does anyone have any last comments they want to make? There's just one thing I just wanted to touch on that Kate just brought up, um, which is with mentioning that actually the majority of our issues in the sector come down to the true cost of food. Yeah. Um, cost of food in this country is too cheap. We're all competing with supermarket prices. And we talk about being able to pay people to work on our farms. And, you know, I'm sure there are an awful, there are an awful lot of farms out there that want to pay people and don't, doesn't, don't want volunteer opportunities necessarily. They want to pay a living wage to trainees and their employees, but they cannot make enough money to be able to pay them. And that comes down to the price that we can sell our food to because we're all in competition with the supermarkets and the large producers. And even the farmers themselves aren't doing great out of supplying to supermarkets. You know, they're caught in their contracts as well. So it's nothing to do with scale. It's not super large scale, small scale, really. It's the fact that, you know, the government have made it and the powers that be that our food is some of the cheapest in Europe and everybody is paying the price. So, you know, it's not on the farms we understand or in the sector that, you know, everyone would love to pay everybody what they're worth and, you know, and and would not like to have all these worries, would like to be able to buy infrastructure, would like to be able to upscale if they couldn't grow their business. But all of it comes down to, uh, unfortunately, our food in this country is too cheap. So there's not, I'm not sure what we do about that. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to touch on that briefly myself, too, because I know that, um, yeah, where I work, for example, I know that the people I work for earn less than I do per hour. Um, so, yeah, it is a major issue. And it's not it's not a decision that, you know, farmers and growers make themselves. It's they can't actually sell the food for what it's worth. And it's yeah, it's incredibly difficult to make a living from this sector. Um, and I mean, most people can't still can't afford food, <laughs> even though it is cheap. So there's there's loads. I mean, this is linked to so many other issues like the housing crisis. And, you know, it, it's really uh, interlinked with so many issues. And I mean, I think one of the things that needs to happen is we need to move. We need to be investing into agroecology and the government needs to be subsidizing local organic food, because if if that's what we're promoting, but people can't afford it, that, you know, that, that they can't those choices are not made on the individual scale, really. There need to be, needs to be national policies around it. Absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone. That's been a really fantastic um, panel and great to hear all uh, everyone's thoughts and uh, much appreciated uh, for you all taking your time to be here. Mm -hmm.